HCAM News Director Tom Nappy here, and today we are joined by head coach of the Ashland Sevens, Jake Obid. Jake, how are you today? How you doing, Tom? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. I'm glad to see that there is summer baseball. It's back. It's not exactly the summer baseball we're used to, but that's okay. We'll take it, right? Oh, yeah, we'll take, we'll take anything at this point. So you must be happy to be back at the helm of the Ashland, well, kind of the Legion team, but technically it really is. They, you got pretty much the players that you would have and a couple additional players that maybe you wouldn't have, but you got pretty much the crew back together and they're playing some baseball. Uh, what's it like to be coaching this team right now? Uh, it's a blast. Um, I mean, it's just like everybody's in the same boat where we needed some form of, of normalcy, um, needed some, some sports, some competition. Uh, so that, I mean, just being involved in that in general is awesome. But this, the group of guys we have this year, they're awesome, awesome kids. We're a deep team again, um, ton of talent, but most importantly, just really just overall, just like good, good kids. Um, and it's a lot of fun to be involved with. And you guys have started off the season four and O, oh, and it was all road games to start off the year. In fact, most of your schedule is road games, but it doesn't seem like that the travel and the different uh, venues really have had any kind of negative impact whatsoever on this team. No, I mean, we, we travel a lot in our normal schedule district five, obviously it's split home and away, um, which isn't the case this year. We have to do, four games at home and 12 on the road. Uh, but I mean, my kids will go anywhere. They'll go anywhere and they'll compete. And most of the time they'll, they'll probably come out with a win. Um, but you know that no matter what, it's not gonna, it's not gonna affect them. And it's a testament to them and how invested they are. Cause it, like what people think about traveling road games, stuff like that, just playing at a new field. But I mean, these kids are there three hours before the game they're at a field getting batting practice in. they're getting to the, to wherever we're playing, they're getting there an hour, a little more than an hour before uh, to stretch out, get loose and just get locked in and ready to go. So the road games, I mean, if anything, it's just built more team chemistry. Um, they're already a tight knit group um, and they love traveling together. So. And uh, so what's the situation been like as far as practices and, and, uh, the tr and also the travel situation. Um, I'd imagine that everybody has to uh, take their own car for that. Um, no, uh, they, they haven't. They, I mean, they all signed the waivers. The parents signed the waivers. Okay. Um, it'd be too difficult to have, like, cause we have, we have a ton of young kids and a lot of kids who can't drive. Right. Um, parents, it's tough for them to, I mean, be driving out to, to Braintree, to Weymouth, to Quincy, like, like, two hours before game time. Like that's just unrealistic. Uh, so the kids have been carpooling, but we haven't been like packing cars. We've been trying to keep it distant. It's, it's really tough as far as carpools go. Um, practices and games, uh, dugouts, everyone needs to have a mask on in the dugout, like myself included. And like, I mean, I'm a super vocal coach. So in the dugout, in the dugout, trying to talk, um, bringing the guys together, it's like, I have to have a mask on. So that's been an adjustment. Um, and I mean, the kids have been good. It's tough. I mean, it's tough to, on a hot summer day, get a group of high school kids to, to wear a mask when they're in. Cause I mean, you know, like they like to be energized on the bench. They like to get it going and, and that's been tough, but they've been, they've been really compliant with it. Um, which has been awesome. Um, it's a weird adjustment though. We have to try and keep distance in the dugout. We have to wear masks in the dugout on the field. We're good on the field at third. I don't have to wear a mask. Um, but it is, it is a weird, weird adjustment, but you do what it takes to play. So, And what's it like to try to talk to the players through the mask? I mean, I'd imagine when you're shouting from the bench that somebody on the field might have a little trouble hearing you through the mask or uh, yeah. are they still able to hear you pretty well? Um, I mean, I have a loud voice, uh, so they're able to hear me for the most part, but I mean, sometimes I'll just step away from the dugout and take off my mask and yell something and put it back on and walk back. Um, so, but I mean, we have a lot more like hand signals, um, like to commute. I mean, you have hand signals to communicate like first and thirds and pitch calls, stuff like that. Um, but 
it's really just working like with your hands, figuring out different ways to communicate. Um, and then I mean, if I need to yell, <laughs> I just, I step away, I pull the mask off and I yell. So <laughs> That's great. Uh, so yesterday uh, you guys took on Braintree and uh, you got a nice seven to five win, your fourth win of the season. And I'm always looking at the game stream stats. Uh, and, and one name that I always see all over the place is Dom Cavanaugh. Oh, yeah. Uh, I know he already had a home run the other night, and he had a number of RBIs the other night. Looks like we might have lost your video for a second there. There you are. Uh, but uh, he has been pretty unbelievable uh, this season. And uh, he seems like, you know, between him and Horning, they're really – the guys that have contributed uh, the most at the plate, obviously there's a number of other good hitters, uh, but what's it like to have Kavanaugh back at it and Jackson Horning behind the plate? Yeah. I mean, having, having Dom, um, I mean, we have a ton of talent, but Dom, I mean, if you look, I have the stats pulled up right here. If you look at his stats, he has 10 RBIs through four games. Um, I mean, he just constantly comes up in big moments. Um, he is such a gamer um, and he's been, this isn't new. Like he's been doing that. He does it in every sport he plays. Uh, he does it for high school baseball. He does it for us. So, I mean, it's been awesome to have, have a guy like him who steps up in and out and just sets a great example for everybody. Having Jackson back again is great. I mean, this is his first year catching for us. Um, and I mean, like losing Sean was tough, uh, but we haven't really missed a beat with Jackson. He's, He's a different type of athlete. Um, so, yeah, it's, I mean, it's great to have kids like that back for sure. And how about some of these new guys that you got? I know there was uh, one guy from, I believe it was Marlboro, and yep. uh, a couple other guys that normally wouldn't be able to be on the team because of location, but a lot of yep. um, locations didn't have the opportunity to even play independent. So you had guys going out and looking towards these teams uh, competing in the independent leagues. Uh, can you talk about some of those guys? Yeah. So we, um, so the, the towns out, it was really like, they ended up being, um, like close to us because we weren't supposed to go far out of our zone and recruit kids. These kids came to tryouts. It was right there between us and Hudson for, for this guy. Um, and he was able to come, which was, which was great. You know, I talked to, um, uh, Steve Mays, he heads the league. I talked to him, um, and he was like, "If it's close, like, just take him." Um, so we were able to get him on, which is great. Uh, but um, next year we may need a waiver. I'm not. I didn't do the maps. We didn't have to do maps this year. But I mean, he was right there, like Marlboro. He's just in a type of Marlboro, a place in Marlboro that's close. So we were able to snag him. Um, and I mean, the biggest thing too, like we have talked about in the past, like AAU, um, there are a lot of kids not playing AAU. Um, and even the ones that are a lot of their like far travel tournaments are canceled. So they're able to be around more. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is, yes, it, it is unfortunate that Legion isn't a thing that there's no state tournament, um, that we're not in district five, but I mean, there's a lot of good that came out of it. District six is awesome. The coaches are awesome. There's a lot of good competition in there. Um, we have 25 kids rather than 18 more kids to be a part of it. It's there, there is a lot of good that has came out of it for sure. Yeah. And I think the most important thing is they get to play baseball. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. And before the show, we were talking a little bit about college recruiting and how some of these independent programs uh, could be big for that. Um, so has any college recruiters reached out to you at all, um, as far as getting some tape on some of these kids, especially the ones that are younger and maybe haven't had a lot of, uh, opportunity to play in high school or in a Legion program? Yeah. So we, we do have a lot of older guys, uh, who are done with the recruiting and stuff like that. But, um, we have a good chunk of young players who, I mean, there's, there's a few who are really young who, I mean, they're not going to get their time yet. So it's tough for me to, to vouch for them to a coach and have them come watch these young kids. Uh, but I mean, when their time comes, they're definitely going to have a shot at playing at the next level. Um, and then there's kids like, like Kevin Balowitz. Um, 
Kevin Ballots, who, I mean, people are people are asking about him. People are coming to games for him. Um, Louis Dennison last night. I mean, there was a college coach of the game, and Louis Dennison pitched great, and he definitely showed a lot of interest in Louis. Um, so there, uh, there is there is a lot, especially now. It's like before they'd probably just come to a game. They wouldn't reach out a lot. Like I reach out to coaches for for the kids I think can play at the next level and have those types of conversations. Um, but now with like the, the recruiting band for a lot of schools, a lot of conferences, um, it is just like videos, getting things on tape, sending emails, just trying to, to give them a, a chance to see the players without being able to come to the games. Right. And um, I'm sure that's something that a lot of the college uh, recruiters will be looking for is videos available of these guys and anywhere that they could possibly see them, uh, especially with the number of the AAU programs um, canceled. And you mentioned uh, Kevin Balowitz hitting a 273 so far, and we know he's uh, pretty tremendous defensively as well. Uh, and he's had some uh, great contributions in these first four games. Can you talk about what uh, his performance a little bit? Yeah, I mean, Kev, uh, the first couple of games, the first two, he wasn't seeing the ball great. Uh, he was still working great at bats. I mean, you look at his, his on-base percentage, it's 430. Um, he was working great at bats. He was getting on base. He was going deep into counts, but he just wasn't seeing the ball well. The last two games, he's four for seven um, with six RBI and has a triple and a pair of doubles. Uh, and all of them came with two outs. Um, all of his RBIs with two outs, all of his extra base hits with two outs. Last night, he had, uh, he had one to give us a, like a bigger cushion. And then in the seventh, he had a two run, two out double to um, what, what eventually was the, the game winning, the game winning hit. We ended up winning seven to five. So um, he's a kid who he's never out of an at bat. Um, he is such a competitor and he, um, he always, always rises to the occasion, steps up. But he has a, he has a bright, bright future ahead of him uh, in baseball for sure. Yeah, and he was certainly a big piece of that uh, state championship contender team last year. Uh, so with the restrictions and stuff like that, what have the practices been like? Is there still that restriction where only limited amounts of players can come to practice or since they signed the waiver, they could all go now? It really depends on the field. Um, a lot of fields do want to keep it like around 15. Um, so we did start – uh, initially there was like a miscommunication. We had a few over, but then we started doing groups. Um, we did get approval before the season to do an inner squad scrimmage, which was really helpful. Uh, but now we're trying to break it up like half and half. And it's just honestly, even regardless of the restrictions, it's just easier to try and break it up half and half, um, and get kids in and out quicker rather than having 25 kids at once. And everyone's there for three hours, two and a half hours. You can get, you can get 10 and 10, like 12 and 12, um, get kids there for an hour, hour, 15 minutes, get them all the reps and just switch groups. So, um, we've been trying to limit it, um, try and keep the players distant, um, abide by the rules of the towns. Um, and yeah, go from there. So what, what are the various rules of the towns? Do they all, do they all vary to a big extent or are they all pretty much the same with little differences here and there? So, I mean, right now I'm, I'm trying to work on getting Hopkinton's fields. Um, I don't know the rules yet. I need to touch base and figure all that out. Uh, but Holliston, it's like, um, we haven't had a game there, so I don't know the game rules, but the practice rules are like, try and limit the kids, try and space them out. If you have a few more than like 10, 15, make sure they're spaced. Um, so we break up the practices really well when that's the case. And then uh, Ashland for games, we're not allowed to be in the dugout. Um, really? So, yeah, players can't use the dugout. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, that's pretty tough. Um, and um, I think kids are going to just have to bring lawn chairs and post up outside the dugout and, see how it goes but yeah that's the that's probably the that's the only field i know that isn't letting us use the dugout but i mean i get it uh we have a field we have a home field so we'll use it but it'll be a little little bit of an adjustment not not having the dugouts 
So is Thursday's game, it's the first home game, really. Is that at Ashland Middle School or is that still to be determined? It's at Ashland Middle School. Um, uh, so we'll see. I mean, if it's, uh, if it's difficult, <laughs> if, it's, if it's difficult without the dugouts, I mean, we might have to look for other options. But, um, I mean, they've been – They've been helpful. Joey Mignani at uh, Metro West has been so helpful, like helping me get fields, help me with uniforms. I mean, that guy is the man. Um, and he's made this process. It's it's been a bit of a difficult process, but he made it a lot, a lot easier for me. Um, so we'll try Ashland Middle. Um, we'll see how it goes, and then we'll have to potentially look at other. I did, I did regardless want to get a couple games in Hopkinton. So um, we'll see. We'll go from there. Yeah, it'd be nice to have a couple night games under the lights and on the Hopkinton turf, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For on sure. that beautiful grass field over there. Yeah. Uh, so, so far you've been to Needham High School uh, and you beat Needham for the first game, 5-2, to two, and then you went to Adams Field and beat Quincy 6-3. to three, And then Libby Field took down Weymouth 9-2 to two, and, and Braintree High School took down Braintree 7-5. Uh, what were those facilities like? And did they have any uh, of those difficult rules, such as not being able to use the dugout or anything like that? What were those uh, facilities like? Oh, uh, man, those, the fields have been awesome. Uh, that's why it's also not really a big – I mean, yeah, the rides can be tough. You get home late, but you're playing at beautiful fields every night. Um, Needham High was gorgeous. Um, and then Adams Field in Quincy. I mean, that's where the state tournament was supposed to be this year. They hosted – pretty frequently and it is an it is an awesome setup um and then libby field in weymouth i don't know if you've been there but it is it's all turf uh batter's eye out in the center beautiful field um braintree had a great setup too it's a little less new than the others but i mean has the has good stands uh the uh, press box um lights so i mean we've, we've lucked out playing at really nice fields and we still got like good fields like franklin um towards the end of the season so it's cool to go and see these these places and play on really nice fields and yeah yeah there's certainly some uh, great facilities uh on your schedule one of the facilities i'm looking forward most forward to that i have yet to do a game at but it looks gorgeous is franklin looking forward to heading yeah. there and uh, Medfield, they always have good facilities. Medfield's great. Well. Mahan and Mahan and Natick tomorrow night's always a good one. Um, so yeah, it's uh, no, it's been it's been fun. It's been cool to play at these fields, play these teams that we haven't before. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you about your opponent tomorrow night. Uh, that's one of the games that we're going to be there for over at Mahan Field against uh, Natick, a familiar Zone Five opponent, uh, and they really I think wanted to play this year because they have a number of returning players from last year and uh, based on what I've seen that team do so far in this uh, independent league play they seem to be strong this year uh, what's it like uh, being back on the field with Natick and have you had any uh, words with uh, coach Lodi yeah Lod Lodi and I are in contact a lot I mean him and I have a really good relationship um, and I mean he's he's a great guy he's a great coach. Um, does a really good job with Natick. Um, he really only pulls from Natick high. Um, and I mean, year in and year out, they're competing for a district title. So it's like a, it's a big credit to him. Um, they, I was talking to him today. They've had four games. They've all been blowouts either way. Uh, they haven't been in a good, they've either blown teams out or got blown out. Um, I know they're, they're pitching. Um, their pitching's not bad. Um, but I mean, I think that's, that's their weak point. They have a good lineup. They hit us well last year. I know there was one – the the first time we played them, it was 9-1, but they left a lot of guys on base. Um, but, I mean, returned a lot of good hitters. They're still young, though. I mean, I, I'm talking to him. He returns 17 next year, so he only has to add one guy to his roster. Um, so he has a lot of young guys. He has a lot of talent. He has a good batting uh, batting lineup. Um, and it's always, I mean, it's always a good competitive game against Natick, uh, and it's a good atmosphere. Um, so I'm excited. I mean, I'm excited to, to get back with a program I know, a coach I know, and just have fun competing against them. It's always, it's always a good time with them. Well, we're certainly looking forward to that game uh, Wednesday night. It should be a lot of fun. And I, I wanted uh, you to explain the playoff system for those that 
don't know. I know you talked about it um, when we had you on the show before, but could you uh, talk about the playoff system? And as you do that, I'm just going to pull up the standings for the uh, Independent Baseball League. Yeah. Um, so uh, the playoffs, um, there, there was we, – we were hoping uh, to do a statewide tournament. Uh, and that just fell through, um, unfortunately. Uh, but we will have the district playoff, of course. And the way that's going to go, there's 16 teams in the league. I think everybody's going to make it. Um, and the top four are going to host a quad of games, so four teams per quad. Uh, and they'll play a double elimination bracket in each of those quads. And the winner, it's, it's kind of set up like the uh, like the regional format in the college college World Series. Um, and then the winners of those will go um, and I think play – I, I believe it's another – the final four will be another four-game double elimination or it'll be one game and then a best two out of three for the championship. It's one of those options. I need to double-check on the, on the final verdict for the email. But uh, regardless, it'll be – I mean, it'll be a competitive, competitive um, format. Uh, and I'm really excited about it. It's a cool new sort of change up from, from the typical format. We'll get more playoff games in and uh, hopefully make another good run. Well, I think uh, it's certainly going to be uh, a fun format and it's going to be a great atmosphere uh, from the four games that you've played so far. What have, what has the crowd situation been? Has there been a lot of people? Have people been allowed everywhere? Uh, what's that been like? Fans are allowed. I think the, the loose rule is try and keep it around like a hundred, 150 people. Um, but people have been distancing. Um, you got people like lined up all down the field in the outfield last night. You can't be in Braintree's outfield. Like there, it's woods. Um, there was a decent chunk of people there. There was, yeah. I mean, their stands had a lot of, had a lot of people. It was probably the most we've had at a game, um, which was, which was good. It was a good atmosphere. Um, but then, uh, most of the others, I mean, you can have people in the outfield. You can have people all over. Um, so there's a lot of room to distance to, to get there and watch a game. Um, Ashland Middle is uh, – you can't be behind the dugouts or home. So um, I, I, I we'll see the setup come Thursday. But, yeah, it's been – I mean, it's been good seeing fans there and as long as they're staying distant and trying to keep the numbers minimal. Um, it's uh, it's good. Well, that's great that fans are still allowed to go because I know that was yeah. a big fear going into the season. Will fans even be allowed? Uh, yeah. So it's uh, certainly great to see fans able to go to these games. And I always thought that they should be able to go because yeah. there's plenty of ways to socially distance at these uh, baseball games and most of these facilities. Uh, yeah. But cl glad to see the fans are still going. Uh, so I'm looking at the stats here, and you got some great pitchers such as Owen Radcliffe, of course, Dom Cavanaugh, and and you had Tyler uh, Dossus throw the other night as well, and you got Louis Dennison back, Dylan Fonseca's got some work. Uh, can you talk about your pitching staff this year? It seems to be pretty well rounded. Yeah, we uh, we did lose. It's unfortunate. Um, Alex Amalfi was supposed to be back, but he is uh, he's playing Futures League, which I mean, good for him. It's going to benefit him big time. I'm, I'm really proud of him and happy for him. Uh, and Brandon Grover was supposed to be pitching for us, but he's, uh, he's out with an arm injury right now. Uh, so we don't know if we're going to have him back, which has been a really tough loss. Cause I mean, after last year, you know how valuable he is. Um, so we are a little slim pitching wise. Um, we have like set seven arms, six arms. Um, but I mean, the, the stats are one of the kids on game changer forgot to sub in Fonseca for, for Radcliffe. Um, in Quincy. Uh, so, so Radcliffe only has four innings pitched, but man, he's a, he's a gamer. He's a good freaking pitcher. Um, Fonseca has been great. Those are two new guys. And then Dossis was awesome on the mound. Uh, so it's four, I mean, four of the five who are going to get like a good four of the six, I should say, or three of the six um, that are like going to get a good load of work or new guys. Uh, and it's already obvious that they're, they're ready to go. They're ready to compete. And then we got Dom and Louie back uh, and they both looked great. So um, I'm excited about our pitching again. I, I do wish we had last year, we had the luxury with having a lot of pitching. Um, 
and a lot of depth in the bullpen. And in a short season, we could really use that. Um, but uh, we're going to make do with what we have. And it's, it's, it is going to be a tough balance because I'm trying to, to limit pitching early on um, because they haven't pitched in a while. We were able to do a lot of like live at bats um, in our squad scrimmages. But um, now it's just like still got to be cautious uh, the first couple starts. And then you can start stretching them out a little more after that. Um, but all in all, I'm excited about this group of pitchers. Well, I'd say you're being a responsible coach because obviously they got rid of uh, those pitch count rules, but you, yeah. you're still uh, uh, smart about uh, the pitching you use, especially with so many games condensed really into a month's time. You got about 16 games in less than a month or so. So yeah. Uh, so tell us about uh, Tyler Doss. So you got to see him against Weymouth the other night, uh, and he's a newbie to the team. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about him? Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna love watching this kid pitch. Um, he is a freaking competitor. Um, he works quick. He has great stuff. He locates, um, and he just loves being out on that mound um, and loves like having control of the game. Um, I mean, there was even their their kids were were talking a lot to him in Weymouth, and he was he was really he was up the other night. Um, and they were looking back. They were looking back at the catcher to try and take signs. And so he just flashed the kid a fastball. He gave him the sign and then struck him out. <laughs> and so he's, that's the type of kid he is. He's a, he's a great competitor. Um, uh, and he's not, I mean, he's not afraid to just go out against anyone and, and do his best. So, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited to, to watch him more this season. It's, it's fun. It's fun to watch. Well, he sounds like he fits right in uh, with your team for sure. Yes, definitely. And uh, Alex Amalfi, you mentioned he is going to the Futures League. He's going to be a Worcester uh, Braveheart. And they're just getting their season uh, underway. Have you heard anything from Alex and how uh, the Futures League is going? Yeah, Al's been, Al's been doing well. He's been coming out of the bullpen um, for them, getting a little bit of work. I think he's going to try and work his way into maybe getting a few starts here and there. They have a, Again, they have a ton of games really quick. Um, so there's a lot of room for him there. Um, we were hoping to work out a double roster, but Brave Hearts don't want him with anyone else. So um, this is definitely the best opportunity for him. Um, so, yeah, he seems to be doing well. I mean, he's enjoying it a lot, which is good. He's playing with uh, Sean Babineau, right. um, which is uh, which is a blast. I mean, I loved playing with Babineau, um, and I know that's probably exciting for him. Uh, and, yeah, I think he's just enjoying the experience and getting work in when he can and just getting better. And I think it's a great opportunity for him. Well, I know I'm uh, looking forward to hopefully getting down to a Bravehearts game at some point this year. As well. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. But, uh, Jake, I want to thank you so much for joining us uh, on the show today, and we'll certainly do this uh, more often as the season goes on to uh, keep up with how everything is going. And we look forward to seeing you very soon and broadcasting some games. Yeah, Tom, I'll see you. I'll see you tomorrow night. I'm excited. Absolutely. That is Jake Obed, the head coach of the Ashland Sevens. You are tuned in to the Hopkinton Hangout Hour. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'm excited today. Jim, Jim's going to co-host this uh, second half hour with me, and I'm excited to have Joe Gamble on. Joe, how are we doing? Terrific, Mike. Thank you for having me. A lot of people might recognize you from seeing your face at uh, ESL and at the uh, HCA and so forth, but uh, we're not here to talk about that. I mean, well, we'll talk about it we'll, because uh, that's part <laughs> of you. So we can go anywhere. We're here to talk about that, Joe. So, uh, Joe, how are you doing throughout this pandemic? Uh, you know, we're, we're, it's, it's a crazy time, um, but we're doing okay. My, myself and my family playing a lot of uh, ping pong in the makeshift ping pong table in our living room. It's getting us through. <laughs> ping pong, make it a comeback. <laughs> I just I gotta up. say, I just gotta say, Joe, that's a really nice camera. It's a good, it's a good quality image there. Uh, uh, Joe, Joe knows lighting. <laughs> Joe, Joe's good with lighting. <laughs> he, he equaled it out. And when we, we chatted this morning and we didn't have that much sun coming in, but he's got a little bit more, but it's not bad. He, he did a nice job. <laughs> Thank you. I Thank love you. having these professionals. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, uh, the kind of uh, things that you, you find yourself changing, 
you, you're used to working out of the house, right? Yeah, the, the work I do is um, innovation consulting and uh, facilitation and training. And mostly that's in person with my clients that wherever they may be around the country or the world. So I, I'm traveling, but when I'm not traveling, I'm working out of my house. And I, I, just happens I haven't been traveling for the last few months. Right. So, yeah, the travel part, I bet you miss it. I'm sure there's some enjoyment to it. Yeah. Yeah, there, yeah, there is. But it's, it's been good. You know, it's good being home. Uh, obviously, the, the, there's lots of challenges around uh, not being able to do your normal work. Um, but, um, but it's always good being home with my, with my family. Yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's true. So um, other things, the other fun stuff we mentioned, uh, ESL. At the State yeah. Left Theater. You, yeah. You volunteer your time there. Yeah, I do. I'm on the board of Interstage Left Theater, and uh, and now we're 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 part of the HCA and becoming ever closer uh, with the HCA. So those are two families that are my extended family in town. Yeah. Yeah, and you like uh, what, what's your favorite part of uh, the theater? Is it the singing? Is it the acting? Is it both? Well, I, I've you know I've been able to find a home there though I can't sing very well and I don't act super well, but somehow there's a home there that will accept me. So I think the favorite part is the feeling of community by the people that, you know, sort of welcome you and, and uh, you find your way to make a contribution there and, uh, and feel a bit of that zing that is, you know, that we, we like to, we like to talk about that, that zing that um, live theater can bring to you. Yeah, it is a lot of fun. I hang around after the show sometime and, even be, you know, seeing the rehearsals or whatever, it's it's a blast. You guys look like you have way too much fun. Mm -hmm. That's for <laughs> sure. We got to get you out there, Mike. Yeah, you know, well, from behind the camera and in front of it. Yeah, well, yeah. All right, we'll see about that. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, as Jim knows, I don't even like doing this. I don't like being in front of the camera. I, you know, face for radio. I can't carry a tune if you unless you put handles on it. You know, it's just, it's it's that hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the big reason why we got you here today, we yeah. want to talk about your new project, the uh, Image Core. Yeah, uh, Imagine Core. Oh, Imagine. Oh. Yeah, it's oh, kind hold of. Hold on a second. Wait a second. I gotta just clean those up. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, Imagine Core. You can think of it like the the Peace Core, but uh, it's for youth. Um, and instead of you know building buildings and so forth, we're we're teaching. Uh, teenagers, creative problem solving, collaborative innovation skills, design skills um, that are going to be helpful for them in their, sorry, in their school, uh, in their future. These are just some of those really powerful 21st century learning skills that, you know, are not the priority in, in, in most middle schools and high schools today. Um, so we're, we're transferring that capability to work together, to imagine, to create, to solve problems. And then uh, marrying that with um, work with nonprofits. So uh, at, the, at the end of the training, we've got nonprofits that are coming in that have real live challenges that they're struggling with and that they need new thinking and new energy um, to, to really overcome and, and seize opportunities. And so that new thinking and new energy is going to come from, from our uh, Imagine Core kids that have been, been trained in these skills. Wow. That's so the idea, having the possibility um, that kids uh, can have for you know, solving whatever challenges that, that come their way now and, and down the road, uh, and then impact in the local community um, to make a difference. And so it's, it's that combination that Imagine Core represents. Well, that's, that's something. So now this is, is it done like, I'm gonna use the word like a camp. Is it, is it like large groups? Is it just more, Smaller groups? Is it one on one? How does how does that work? Yeah, it's small. It's more smaller groups. It's it's it is going to be virtual. I mean, the dream I've had. This has been a dream for, you know, for a long time to take the field in which I work and the, I'm constantly training and facilitating and developing, you know, adults. So this is an opportunity to take that to kids. Um, the original dream was that we'd uh, run the program live over um, five days or so, or um, and then have an internship over the course of the next, you know, three weeks, but it would be in person. Now, of course, with COVID, uh, we, I put all those plans on hold and, and now have uh, taken a step back and shortened the program a bit, but made it virtual. So it'll be, uh, there's, there's two programs to choose from. 
um, a two-day program that's nine hours over two days, and that's called Breakthrough Thinking. And there's a four-day program um, called the Innovative Team Workshop, which is um, it's 18 hours over four days. So it's all virtual. The, the groups are going to be, you know, about maybe six to ten. Um, and then I'll be working with them personally in the, in the sharing the skills, sharing, doing lots of exercises. So it's highly interactive, uh, teaching the tools and, and the methods uh, and them getting practice constantly with those tools and with those methods um, over the course of that time. And then, as I say, we have nonprofits coming in um, for the last three hours uh, to really work on a challenge that, that they have. Yeah, their biggest biggest problems for the nonprofits is trying to re-energize their group, correct? Yeah, that's a lot. You know, certainly there's fundraising. Certainly it's attracting energy and, and uh, you know, supporters. Um, and then there's other challenges that come up. And, and this is something that, that my firm's been doing for 60 years. Uh, the firm that I've been with is one of the pioneers of the whole field of creative problem solving and 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 collaborative innovation. So we've been often training our clients and bringing in nonprofits for them to practice on and everybody wins uh, in that. Uh, and so this is an opportunity for, you know, for the local nonprofits that we have right here in our community um, uh, to, to offer up and sponsor a challenge and have it worked on. Um, so we've got three, we've got three non -spon or three nonprofits that are going to be part of the, this inaugural year, if you will, of, uh, of Imagine Corps. Um, the first is Project Just Because, um, and Cheryl will be coming in, and she will be, you know, sharing with the with the kids what she's struggling with, um, and the kids working with Cheryl and maybe some of her team inventing new solutions um, to that challenge. Uh, and then that's that's next week, uh, the uh, 14th and 15th, and then the week after that, the 20th and the 21st, we have, uh, which is another cohort that we'll be you know, having of kids. We've got um, uh, the Hopkinton Community Partnership, uh, which is a relatively new nonprofit. So they'll be coming in. And again, they're doing some wonderful thing across, things across the community. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last one, the week of the 27th of June, we've got Live, Live for Evan. And so um, uh, Jack Nealon will be coming in then and sharing the challenge that, that they have for, for Live for Evan. So those... Uh so they're working in. Do you expect them to walk out of there with a good, solid idea that they are going to bring back, or is it something that just gets them started to continue? Is it? Yeah. So um, for this year, so so this is sort of level one where we're just training kids to in these skills. Yeah. Um, for that, for that first, these first introductory sessions, there will be ideas, you know, solutions that have been concepted out a variety of solutions for the nonprofit. Um, and so from that standpoint, at that point, it's a possibility for impact, but you really do have to move things forward and actually, you know, everybody has great ideas, but then taking those great ideas and moving them into action. And, um, the way we'll lean into that, if you will, is, um, I'll be encouraging the, the kids, for those that want to volunteer to continue with the program, I'll be running another session to take the concepts and continue to evolve them, work with the nonprofit and their team to take, create shared ownership around those concepts and, and you know, set a platform for, for moving them forward. So I'll facilitate those for you know, whoever of the, of the kids that are involved in the, in the, in the workshops want to continue on. Um, and many do because, you know, what we're seeing is that they're really excited to make an impact in the community. That's, um, that's been one of the big drivers for people to participate, the kids to participate. Um, and then, and then um, beyond that, at the end of the season, we'll have a, a concept jam where we'll have all the parents and all the kids uh, and all the sponsors uh, the, or the nonprofits and uh, uh, and others that have helped make it a success, we'll have a big concept jam where we'll all share the challenges, share the concepts in a way that actually um, builds on them so that there's more traction to, to carry them forward. 
Now, a after that, um, you know, it's sort of, it's up to the nonprofits and whoever wants to stay engaged to really see it through to implementation. And I'll be there to support it. Um, and so, so we're hopeful that, you know, that, that it will come to fruition, that some of the ideas that our kids come up with are actually implemented. And, and, and All right, Joe, that sounds really great. I got a couple of questions for yeah. you. First one's really easy. I can't read. Is it about my lighting, Jim? No, it's okay, not. Thank you. But it's close. Okay. I can't read the fourth window. Dream, believe, imagine. Is it do? It's do. It's ah, do. Actually, okay. you know, the funny thing is, is the the first three are are metal. You know, they're they're they're. I've had them for years. Yeah. And um, you know, through this COVID, I've I've just been a bit frustrated in moving some of the dreams forward. And so I made a commitment that, you know, I'm going to actually move things into action that I've long, you know, uh, had an image of bringing to life. Um, and Imagine Core is one of them. So what I did, that fourth one is do, it's made out of cardboard and I stole the D <laughs> and I sort of massaged the A, made it an O. And so I stuck it up there to say the fourth window is where I got to live right now. So That's, awesome. Asking, That's awesome. That's awesome. So now you started, you started talking about my next question is, yeah, yeah. where did this concept and idea come from? Uh, so th the work I do and the firm that I've been with started this field, one of the pioneers of this field um, in the 60s. They, they used to run the invention and design group at Arthur D. Little, which is uh, you know, one of the first consulting firms in the world. I, I coincidentally worked for them uh, when I got out of college in, in 86. And when I joined, it was their 100th anniversary. Uh, and uh, the guys who, who worked for Arthur D. Little in the, 50s, uh, in the 50s and 60s and used to run the invention and design group, they would hold up for days and weeks and months and try to solve challenges that their clients would bring. You could think of them as the, one of the first design firms in the world. Uh, and they would often be successful and, you know, sometimes not successful. They became fascinated with the human dynamics, the behaviors that would help and the behaviors that would get in the way. Um, and they started to codify this, no this body of knowledge around creative problem solving and collaboration and innovation. They spun off from Arthur D. Little in, in the 60s and formed Synectics, Synectics World. Um, I joined Synectics World 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago. And we, instead of being the inventors, they sort of today you'd call it a pivot. We've been facilitators, catalysts, coaches with the idea really that people embrace what they create. So that's what we've been doing for corporations around the world. A big part of that is embedding the capability to do this on an ongoing basis within our clients. So, so as part of that, training them as facilitators, training their teams, and that's where the spark came from. As I say, we, we used to bring in the fifth day of our five-day program, nonprofits, for our clients to, to work on the challenges. And just like I'll be doing, uh, at least for the Innovative Team Workshop, we're recording, in this case, it'll be the kids, working on those challenges so that we can debrief with the kids and they can see what are the behaviors that are helping? What are the behaviors that are getting in the way so they can become better at how they solve problems together? So the idea, we've been doing it for adults for, for decades. The idea of taking it to kids has always been in part of me. I used to run the kids software division for Hasbro, you know, which was you know, Tonka and Candyland and Monopoly. I was the brand manager for all those in software. And a lot of it was, you know, play and guided discovery and, so there's been always a part of that for kids in me, and this is a way of you know, bringing those two worlds together. And yeah, the kids are our future, so Lord knows we need this kind of way of solving problems and collaborating in our adult worlds. You know? and, and so this is, this is my little way of starting with kids now, and hopefully they'll be better at it when they're our age. So Imagine Core is all you. Well, there's a lot of sponsors and supporters. You know, the, it's the, the, the firm I'm with is Synectics World, and they're a, they are a sponsor. Mm -hmm. um, but the vision for, for Imagine Core is that uh, it's a, it's a self-sustaining organization, nonprofit, or to be honest, 
uh, it's been kind of a rush to, to start it. So it's either going to be a nonprofit or a B corporation as we, as we grow it. But yeah, it'll be uh, a separate organization with a lot of community support um, and sponsors to hopefully make a difference uh, in the world together. And I have to say, I have one um, co-founder, if you will, he's with a client, uh, was with a client of mine, Primera Blue Cross, uh, Blue Shield, well, the Blue Cross out in Seattle, Washington. And so this is a dream that we've both had uh, for, for a long time. A lot of people will make it successful, and, and, and that's just okay with me. Right now, are you the, are you the only employee of the company? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, my, it's my dream right now. And, and, but I have to say, there have been others, wonderful people, right here in Hopkinton. And, you know, I started this thinking um, colleges and universities, uh, that's where I would start. Um, uh, but it's very difficult to break into their curriculum and to their, you know, their, their flow of their year. And I was at a, I've had a lot of mentors, thankfully so, um, both at Synectix and uh, George Prince uh, being the founder and then many others. And then um, others in the creative community. It's, it's a wonderful community. I, I speak at a lot of conferences. Um, Around, around the world. I was supposed to be in Italy last month, but that didn't happen, but maybe, uh, maybe in October. But there's a wonderful community of these creativity um, and innovation practitioners that are really supportive as well. Um, one of them is uh, Stan Griskevich, who I'm gonna have a phone call with after you guys. And uh, he, he was one of the founders of the Center for Creative Leadership. So he's been an inspiration, lots of inspirations. At one of his uh, conferences, I first pitched this idea 18 months ago for the first time beyond just a handful of inner circle people. And there was an overwhelming response. And one of the questions I asked was, where should I really begin? Should it be college students or someplace else? And the, the overwhelming response was um, middle school and high school kids because our education system just really isn't set up. It, this isn't a pr priority. These kinds of skills isn't a priority, yet it's really needed in working on projects that will be happening for them the rest of their lives. So I was really encouraged by that community to go younger. Um, and then at the end of the day, you know, part of that do, Jim, that you teased out of me, mm -hmm. I said, you know, this year is the year. I, I really want to pilot this year to, to, just to, to get it off the ground and, and it will morph it. It's part of the experimenter's mindset, right? We'll see how we need to evolve it. Well, I decided to do it in Hopkinton. I said, what better place than just, I'm gonna do it for middle school, high school kids in my own town, in my own community, nonprofits in my own town, my own community and, um, and make a difference. And there's been some wonderful people, Kelly Grill as an early, uh, you know, early supporter, um, uh, um, uh, Christine Chapman, who's uh, they're, they're also associated with the with the HCA, but also runs an organization called the Education Station here in town for kids and supporting them and their plans for college. She's been a big supporter. The nonprofits that have now been involved uh, 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 have been wonderful. Wonderful Heather Smith and uh, Cheryl Ann from uh, Project Just Because and Jack. So. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of people that I have a, a lot of gratitude for this first beginning. Mm -hmm. And when, when kids show up there and they're there for two, two days, you said? The for one program is just a two day, nine hours over two days. And the other is a four day program, um, 18 hours. Okay. Yeah. And they're learning creative problem solving, thinking yeah. outside the box? Yes, yes. Yeah, so there's, there's, there's really three things, um, you know, at a high level. One is how to think differently about a challenge, to see it in a different way uh, through different lenses. Um, so some of that is just the diversity that they each bring to an idea or to a challenge. So honoring the diversity that, that, that everyone brings and um, building on that diversity. Um, then there's some other tools around thinking, which is, you know, wishing and analogy and metaphor, 
uh, even absurdity, Jim, because, you know, Albert Einstein said, if an idea is not at first absurd, there's no hope for it, <laughs> particularly when you're trying to get to really something that's breakthrough. But the wonderful part is getting them to think really speculatively, experimentally, not in a self-censoring way because we can be the most punishing or self-censoring of ourselves. But what you need a couple other things that we'll teach them and you need a way of taking a beginning idea and a process for really morphing it and evolving it and putting it into action. So they'll not only learn how to think differently, how to listen differently, open-mindedly, but they'll also learn a process for getting ideas and, and evolving and treating ideas. Mm -hmm. And then the third component is around climate and field. And it, that really is about how we treat each other, how we treat ideas, and how, and how we treat ourselves. And, you know, that, 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 that tone of safety, um, being more savvy with each other, and understanding how the effects that you can have on people, even if you're, you're not intending to do so, mm -hmm. you know, that's part of the hidden that's kind of the Trojan horse stuff that, that they will get um, and it'll impact their lives in ways they don't even realize yet. Um, not just when they're trying to solve a problem, but just how they interact with each other. Right. So just out of curiosity, has anyone ever said, isn't it kind of antithetical to make a curriculum to think creatively? Yeah. And that's, um, you know, that's, that's part of the magic because creativity really, if you find a paradox, where this, is, this seems to be true and this seems to be true, but they're totally at odds. Often when you figure out how, where there's truth in both, that's where the unlocker is. And that is the, the, the sort of ironic thing, if you will, of creating a process to be creative. Um, but it's really a way of mapping how great, really inventors, you know, where do you get your ideas? How do they come? How do we work together when we're most successful? Um, how do we get to breakthrough is observing that. And this, is, this body of knowledge all, is all through observation. Hundreds, thousands of hours of back in the day audio taping and then videotaping. And even, even here next week, we'll be videotaping or not next week, but in the, in the four day program, we're actually going to be uh, Zoom recording these days, the sessions. So when kids are practicing, we'll then take a look at what happened and they can learn from that. Have you taught these programs before? Well, the yes, the, I've taught all of them many, many, many times. <laughs> you know, over over almost twenty years, um, uh, mostly for for college age and mostly adults. Um, so I'm I'm shifting in them in two ways: a little bit customizing it for younger kids, um, which is not that hard because kids. I've I've actually taught kids these programs before, both in college and I've taught my own son, um, Nicholas, when he was 16 years old, I had five kids in our basement and we took them through a four day program to be facilitators, five day program to, to actually be facilitators. Um, so in one way it's fine tuning it for virtual, um, which actually requires more fine tuning than fine tuning it for younger kids. Cause you know, the truth is Mike, the, you know, the younger you are, the more savvy you are already with this. We kind of, we, our traditional way of drill and practice and you know, learning content um, encourages, I guess, a performance expectation of getting it right versus wrong. So in some ways with adults, I have to unlearn things, <clears throat> things that younger kids right. have more naturally. Right. So you have um, uh, tonight an information session, right? Can you explain yeah. what you get from that? What, what's the information? Sure, that's for parents and for kids. Uh, and I've, had, I've done a number of them. And I, sometimes it's the, the, it's the kids that come. Sometimes it's the parents. Sometimes it's both. It's an hour. And I will take them through the program. I'll give them some, some bits of experiences of what they, what, what they can expect. Um, I'll take them through the entire program, the beliefs behind it, what they'll get. Um, and then I open it up to questions. So just, so they're very comfortable with, um, what they're, what they as kids or what the parents, um, know their kids will be going through. So that's seven to eight o'clock, uh, tonight. I'm sure you'll 
provide maybe a, you know on our website or yeah, some other way the, yeah. the links for that seven seven to eight this evening and then seven to eight next monday which is the 13th and then next thursday which is the 16th and we still we still have spots open in um in all of the programs um we're getting more full for next week's but but we still have um, a few spots even for next week. And next week is the the 20th and 21st, and then after that, 27th. And next week is the uh, 14th and 15th. 14th and 15th, yeah. Right, so that's going to be the two-day breakthrough thinking. And then um, the same would be the 20th and 21st, the two-day breakthrough thinking. And then the 27th through the 30th is a four-day program. That's the Innovative Team Workshop which gets a little bit more into the, the climate and the human dynamics and the, the emotional intelligence aspect. That's right. And to find you, there's several ways. You have the website, which we just showed, but you, yes. uh, you're also on Facebook. Yes, yes. And Instagram. And I, and I will be changing the website. I've just had to acquire it, um, imaginecore.org. Um, so I'll be switching eventually the website, which was a thank God for my son to, to, who built the website for me two weeks ago on Wixit. Um, but we'll be move, morphing that. But for now, you do have all the, the website information. Um, um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to be sharing this, of course, and, and then some other announcements that Absolutely. we have. Um, like a big one, I don't know. Um, if I, if I have a moment to share this, this last one. You do. Yeah. So we, part of the, part of the stakeholders, one is, is clearly the kids, right? It's for the kids, right? For their development and for their, for their growth. The second is for the nonprofits, for the impact that we can help kids make and we can make in our community. Those are the, the two organizations or the two entities where groups were really supporting. The third is the mentors like myself, and practitioners, that eventually when this is around the world, you know, we'll have more really expert practitioners in this field that will be giving back to those two entities. But the fourth is uh, a sponsors and corporate sponsors. So the idea is that corporate sponsors would, would help defray the costs so that everybody can participate in the program. And we do have scholarships. That's I was what just going to, I was just going to. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if, if folks, especially in this time, a difficult time for sure, you know, if, if um, there's some struggle there, but they really are excited to participate in the program, I want to make it happen for them. Um, sure. So I'm committed to doing that. So we will apply scholarships uh, um, uh, for those that, that, you know, have a defined need and, and are motivated and can really see how this could impact their lives. Oh, that's outstanding. Now, do, do you take this kind of thing to an actual nonprofit to help them out? Do they... Do you group up nonprofit groups and let them work amongst themselves? Yeah, well, I have done a lot of work with nonprofits, um, um, uh, certainly in health myself. So I often facilitate nonprofit sessions um, so that they can help, help push them forward. Even in this time, especially, um, I'm doing one tomorrow, um, working with Martha's Vineyard, um, on helping to increase the participation in the 2020 census. They're at a relatively low um, percentage of people that have responded to the census. Excellent. And uh, so we're gonna be, I'm gonna be facilitating some virtual creative problem solving sessions for a group of people to help increase that. And that's, that's pro bono. Excellent, well, Joe, thank you for all your work. Good seeing you. Hopefully I'll see you soon in person, but we gotta wrap up. And I want to wish you all a very, very good day. Meet James. He was surprised to find out that he has elevated blood pressure, which could turn into high blood pressure. So he talked with his doctor about a healthy path to get his numbers down. He quit smoking, which makes a big difference for his overall heart health. He also cut down on salt by watching out for high sodium on food labels and added a 30-minute walk five days a week to his routine. 
These healthy steps weren't easy, but lowering his blood pressure was worth it. Learn more about his healthy path 